Now diaphragm, uh, we can track the motion of the diaphragm by putting in markers and we can clearly see the right hemi diaphragm is moving much more as compared to the left side and you can plot it in, on a diagram uh, and look at these, these information. It's dynamic, don't need to do any fluoro. Uh, since we did some work on diaphragm, I'll just emphasize a little more time on the diaphragm. Uh, the diaphragm has, it's a basically it has a central uh, tendon, which is this white structure, and then more of the peripheral musculature. Post it has a posterior attachment and anterior and lateral attachment. Posteriorly, it has two diaphragmatic crura, which, which we all know, or always see on the CT, and they attach to the upper lumbar uh, bodies, and anterior vertebral bodies. Uh, then there are lateral and the medial arcuate ligaments, which we also know. Sometimes these arcuate ligaments on CT can look like a nodule, can fool you. And uh, they are important for the function of the, uh, the uh, uh, diaphragmatic crura. Uh, and of course, median uh, arcuate ligament can cause compression of the celiac artery. We know celiac artery syndrome. Uh, the anterior and lateral attachments are to the inferior sternum and xiphoid process and inferior left uh, or bilateral sixth ribs and adjacent costal cartilages. Uh, the nerve innervation is by the phrenic nerve, C345 and they anteriorly go along the pericardial surface and then they splay on the superior aspect of the diaphragm bilaterally. And the function of the diaphragm is, it is the primary muscle of ventilation, okay? When, when you do uh, meditation or yoga, they tell you to take a deep breath, your diaphragm is doing most of the work. Uh, of course, there are other muscles, the muscle that the thoracic inlet or the accessory uh, lateral chest wall muscle. So they basically expand the chest wall in all directions. So you can inhale more air in. It also decreases the intrathoracic pressure, which causes increased venous blood flow back to the, your heart. In addition to the ventilation, uh, it also aids in emesis, urination, defecation. Uh, I don't have to tell you, you probably have experienced that when you, use this diaphragm, and it also prevents gastroesophageal reflux by exerting external pressure at the esophageal hiatus. So diaphragm dysfunction can be either paralysis, total paralysis, no movement, or it can be weak. It moves, but not normally, or it can be due to a condition called eventuration. It is a congenital anomaly. Uh, so diaphragmatic dysfunction is a frequent contributor to shortness of breath or dyspnea, which is a common complication from a lot of diseases of, uh, in the chest. So let's look at the eventuration. What exactly is eventuration? It's the congenital weakness of the diaphragm where the lateral aspect of the musculature is not developed and it is replaced by a thin membranous sheet. But the diaphragm is there. But over time, this region stretches and on inspiration, it does not contract normally. In fact, if you do a fluoro, I'll show you the example, it behaves abnormally. So here is a patient with elevated right hemi diaphragm, and on the lateral view, what you see is the anterior portion of the diaphragm is elevated, where the posterior is not. This is a case of partial eventuration, which is more common than complete eventuration, where entire diaphragm is uh, eventrated. Uh, here is the lateral view, and on the CT, you can see the part of the liver which is uh, uh, protruding inside the chest looks like a water from the Star War, right? This head. <laughs> so what are the common causes for diaphragm paralysis and weakness? Most common is surgery. Uh, whether it is, usually it is a cardiac surgery, uh, it's usually more on the left side because during the cardiac surgery, we do cardioparesis with cold. So initially those uh, phrenic nerves are uh, injured, they get numb. So initially there is a temporary elevation of the diaphragm, but that will recover in few days to weeks. But if the, during surgery the nerve is cut, then it is irreversible. So that will lead to persistent elevation of the left hand from over time. And of course, trauma, it can be penetrating injury to either side or even a blast injury from a significant uh, remote gunshot injury or sometimes traumatic uh, motor vehicle accident can also cause uh, frantic injury. The tumors, whether it is primary lung cancer or metastatic disease to the mediastinum or hyla, they can involve frantic nerve and leads to diaphragmatic paralysis. Infection is, is a major category. It's almost when we call idiopathic elevation, which we don't have. Usually it is infection. 
But in addition to regular viral infection, patients who have shingle or Lyme disease uh, or even guillain barre they can uh, involve the phrenic nerve. And even metabolic, diabetic metabolic acidosis can also affect the phrenic nerves. And if the patient has prior radiation treatment, for example, Hodgkin lymphoma or breast cancer in the upper mediastinum, that can lead to injury due to fibrosis, the phrenic nerve. Now, diaphragm dysfunction, sign and symptoms, they are variable. It can be dyspnea, decreased exercise performance, sleep disorder symptom, hypersomnia, et cetera. If it is bilateral, it is worse as compared to unilateral. And these symptoms are worse in supine position because in supine diaphragm is already elevated, so it, it does not, cannot exert function properly. And in submerged position, so patients who go to swimming, when they submerge in the water, they said their symptoms become more apparent. And once you do the PFTs, they are mostly restrictive. Again, worse with the bilateral and worse with in supine position as compared to erect. So indication of sniff testing, which we do at UAB, uh, all pre-lung transplant patients undergo sniff testing. Uh, and if there is a clinical evidence of diaphragmatic dysfunction, whether it is elevated hemidiaphragm or unexplained shortness of breath, or symptoms of a lying supine or in the water, or associated comorbidities of heart, lung, or obesity, or new exercise limitations. So these cases do end up, you know, we are excluding different uh, etiologies, so diaphragm is one of the causes for uh, these dysfunctions. So when you do sniff tests, uh, it can be either normal, there is regular movement of the diaphragm during normal breathing, deep breathing, and sniffing. They both move in same direction. If it is paralyzed, the paralyzed diaphragm will not move, and with sniffing, it will move paradoxically in the wrong direction. And if it is weak, you will see the movement of both diaphragm, but the, the weak diaphragm no don't move that much. And with, paradox with sniffing, it might show actually paradoxical movement. And this is the tricky part, but if you see paradoxical movement, not every diaphragm is paralyzed. It can be weak. It's still not paralyzed, but you'll show a paradoxical movement. Here are some examples, 54-year-old with chronic interstitial lung disease and uh, pre-lung transplant evaluation. Patient has both emphysema and basal or interstitial lung disease. You can see it here. And uh, we did a DDR, and you can show symmetrical diaphragm movement and uh, no paradoxical movement. This is patient with right hemidiaphragm elevation. Uh, it is completely elevated, right hemidiaphragm. It is not the partial diaphragm, and the liver is elevated on the lateral view, on the coronal CT view. And on the conventional air, uh, imaging, chest fluoroscopy, you can see the sniffing is positive. This paralyzed right diaphragm is going other way when you sniff in, as compared to the left side. Here is the sniff testing with the DDR, same finding, the right hemidiaphragm is going up when you take a sniffing compared to the other side. So this can be done with DDR very easily. So what happened with the diaphragmatic eventuration? The eventuration on the right side, this right hemidiaphragm is elevated. With quiet breathing, they both move, but this diaphragm is moving less as compared to the other side. So this is not totally paralyzed. But when you do the sniffing, you can see this is kind of giving you paradoxical movement. So this is actually not paralyzed diaphragm. This is just a eventuration, a weak diaphragm, with, which with increased intra-abdominal pressure or sniffing, it cannot do the regular movement which normally can be achieved. But you have to have a lateral view to show this. And you can do the lateral view now, this is typical Alabama patient, right? The BMI of only 56. And the patient has obstructive sleep apnea, recurrent bronchitis, cough, tonic dyspnea, very elevated right hemidiaphragm. But we, when you look at the lateral, this is a scout uh, CT images, the anterior portion of the diaphragm is elevated, not the posterior portion. This is obviously what we learn now, this is likely is eventuation, not paral paralysis. Paralysis does not cause focal paralysis, right? It is all uniform. So we did a regular fluoro examination. Because of her body weight, you know, it's very difficult to see what's going on. But you can see this diaphragm is moving with regular breathing. It does not move that much, but it moves. And here is the DDR image, again showing very clearly the right diaphragm from the left diaphragm is here below her big heart. So they are moving, but does not move that clearly. 
So the diaphragm was not a problem for heart problems. But what we did was also did a dynamic 40 CT to look at her airways, and what we see is she has severe tracheobronchomalacia, which was causing her symptom. This is a dynamic CT, free breathing during the scanning, and you can look at during expiration, this whole trachea is kind of collapsed. All right, diaphragmatic pacing for spinal cord injury. This is a big, big problem, although the patients are, are limited population, but very important uh, subject. In diaphragmatic uh, pacing, what we do is we uh, have a lightweight battery-powered system electrically, which electrically stimulates the diaphragm muscle and nerves. So basically, this is a, a, a generator, and the wires go in or leads go in, and they go on both sides. You can actually control uh, from outside one diaphragm or the other, which way to st uh, stimulate. Now the diaphragm pacing, uh, although it is a very trivial thing, but it can tremendously improve the quality of life in these patients. It can reduce or eliminate the time spent on ventilator. These are the quadriplegic patients who have a C-spine injury, C345 uh, transection. So unfortunately they are ridden to, you know, ventilator or on a, a wheelchair. You might have seen in the movies, you know, all the time. Uh, pacing can help their breathe and they may be able to speak normally, uh, increase their mobility and transportation because they are not dependent on the ventilators and they make their regular day activities uh, more easier, dressing, bathing, and just moving around in the house. Uh, also, it, once the lungs start moving, the chances of getting infections are decreased and it also improved the sense of smell and taste because of the lungs are getting better. So we had one patient, this is a, a football player, a college football player, who got you know, injured during the game and he got quadriplegic at C-spine level. And uh, he was, uh, had a tracheostomy, long-term tracheostomy, and uh, they did a pacing of the diaphragm and we wanted to see his function of the diaphragm after the pacing. So uh, when we do the DDR with the pacer off, you can see both the diaphragm kind of move, but they are not very aggressively moving. So, uh, but when you look at the, with the pacing on, these diaphragms show more improvement as compared to the maybe pacing off. It's not dramatic, but you know, still, this can improve with physiotherapy, you know, once you do that, and, and these patients will be able to improve their day-to-day -day activities. So this is a brief uh, testing we did comparing the DDR with the chest fluoroscopy. Uh, we looked at 19 patients, so 38 hemidiaphragms. Uh, we found six abnormalities. Uh, three were uh, severe diaphragmatic weakness and three were eventuration. Unfortunately, there was no paralysis during that period. Uh, people knew that we are doing a test that they did not show up. <laughs> uh, so what we found was uh, majority of the uh, issues on the diaphragm dysfunction, we were able to look with DDR. And additionally, the DDR was able to show, because it's a large field of view, you can see the entire lung, anything else going in the lung, and uh, hiatus, hernia, et cetera. So we looked at all of our radiology colleagues, you know, they prefer DDR over chest fluoroscopy. This was only with PA view. You know, this is not lateral because we did not knew, you know, what's going on. But once we have done this and we found one case we called weakness, it was eventration, which we only see on the lateral view, we said we implemented the PA and lateral uh, sniff testing on these patients, but decreased the exposure to 12 seconds rather than 20, just to re reduce the overall radiation. And I think this is what we are going to go forward, January forward, replacing the regular chest fluoroscopy with a DDR. Now for chest fluoroscopy, this is done at the, our outpatient patient. During COVID, you know, we did not have a man, person supply, uh, person there physically, so we had to go from the hospital to that side to, you know, do the chest fluoroscopy. But if you have a DDR, you don't have to do it. They will take the images, you can review on the packs, and that's it. 